I'm quite pleased we've got our cups of tea and our French fancies here for our <laughs> chat. Um, so, um, yeah, 50 years ago, um, when, uh, when Apollo 11 was preparing to, uh, to land on the moon, uh, in fact, I think they just, um, I think Armstrong and Aldrin had just got in the lunar module at this moment in time, 50 years ago, uh, ready, to, ready to undock. Um, Bob, here, uh, was here um, at Jodrell Bank. And, uh, and I'll just uh, show you a picture um, <laughs> to, to prove that that's the case. It was um, 50 years ago. <laughs> looks exactly the same as he did then. There he is on the left. Um, Uh, he's with uh, a couple of colleagues. I don't know, do you want to s let us know who these people are that you're with? Yes, the one on the right is, of course, Sir Bernard Lovell, the director, and the one in the middle was... Uh, he might have been only docked then, but it was Professor J.G. Davis, uh, who was s sort of second in command, and he, he was my immediate boss on the technical side of things. Yeah, so this is, um, this is basically the similar scene. This was actually taken in 1967, I think, this photograph. Right, um, yes. But, uh, but it was in... I mean, do you want to tell us about where you were when you, did, when you were doing this work? Yes, it was um, a lab just um, in the main building, and that contained all the equipment that we used. Um, I first came to Jodrell in... 1961, because there had been Americans working at Jodrell, uh, tracking one of their deep space probes, and when they left Jodrell, they left quite a lot of their equipment behind. And so Professor Lovell decided it would be a good idea to set up a special lab purely for tracking space probes and moon probes, and to start off as a basis with this equipment that the Americans had left behind. So that was the scene that I moved into uh, when I first started at Jodrell. Yeah. I mean, how had Jodrell got involved in space tracking in the first place? Because it wasn't something that you'd expect, perhaps, a radio telescope to be doing. Oh, no. I mean, Professor Lovell was at great lengths all the time to stress that Jodrell back was inherently concerned with doing radio astronomy research and producing, you know, top-class world-leading radio astronomers. <laughs> um, but I think it, it started off, first of all, with the launch of Sputnik 1, the Russian Earth probe. And there were people around who wouldn't or couldn't believe that the Russians had actually managed to do what they had done. I mean, to launch something and actually get it into orbit around the Earth needed a tremendous amount of power. Uh, I mean, and, and these essentially were inter intercontinental ballistic missiles, um, you know, the rockets for them. Um, luckily, the, the Lovell Telescope had just been built. It was just about being commissioned and it was got into service to track the carrier rocket of Sputnik. By track, I mean it was used as a radar aerial. Now, for those of you who don't know, normally with radio astronomy, you, you just sit there and listen to the signals coming in from outer space and somehow make sense of them. But with a radar, you actually use your aerial as a transmitter as well, and you send out pulses of radio waves which hit the object, they're reflected and come back and picked up. And by measuring how long it's taken for the signals to go out and come back again, you can tell how far it is. And yeah, we've got a picture of... Um there's Lovell on the... Yes. And, and looking at the, at the echo uh, from the... The from echo the is coming rocket. back from that. So from that point onwards, people sort of thought, oh, well, you know, perhaps Jodrell can keep an eye on things for us. The main thing was that we were just uh, part of the University of Manchester, a scientific body, not allied to government departments or anything like this. 
So we were completely open. And in fact, just before I started working there, there had been these Americans there tracking one of their space probes. And shortly after them, a group of Russians came in to the same lab, also wanting to track uh, one of their space probes. And this was because the Lovell telescope was the largest fully steerable telescope in the world. And so from that time, um, we started watching mm. the Russian space probes, so, yeah. moon probes. So it's a very unusual thing, really, because we were, I mean, I suppose not quite neutral, but, but, but sitting between these two great superpowers and, yeah. and being involved in working with both. Well, yes, I mean, you know, hopefully people will believe that we could give a scientific decision Mm -hmm. not based on any alliance to mm. uh, any of the superpowers. Mm. And that, uh, that in fact, was reinforced uh, when you came to Luna 2. Now, Luna 2 was the first space probe that actually hit the moon. Now, we've talked about having enough rocket power to get something up into orbit around the Earth. This space probe had enough rocket power to get it out of the gravitational field of the Earth and attracted to the moon, and it reached the moon and crash-landed. Now, at that point, there were a lot of people who said, no, the Russians can't possibly have done that. And at Jodrell, we had done observations, taken measurements, and we categorically said, yes, this spacecraft hit the moon at the sort of time they said it did, and we had calculations to prove it. And so from that point, the world started to come to look to Jodrell to say, right, have the Russians done what they said they've done? I mean, the Americans, they were very open. They told you about everything they were going to do well beforehand. The Russians said nothing until they'd done it. Um, so it was I think in the, in the case of Luna 2, did they not send the um, coordinates and the details through to Jodrell Bank before the...? I, I, I don't know, because it was before I started there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I think they... Um, yeah, that idea that there was a closed sort of thing that the, the Soviets were doing, but the... Uh, but the Americans were more open, and George yeah. Bank was letting people know what had happened. It was quite a key oh, yes. part yeah. of the story. Yeah. yeah. So how did you? I mean, you you say like you say you weren't there at the time of Luna Two. You weren't there in 1959, but and you arrived in 61. 61. So yes. what? How did you come to arrive at George Bank? How did you? How did you choose to come here? Um, well, I I lived nearby. I just graduated from Manchester University with a degree in electrical engineering. And because I'd lived near here, I had actually come to Jodrell as a summer student for two years beforehand. So when I graduated, I thought, right, where should I work? Well, Jodrell Bank sounds a nice place. Um, and so I came for an interview and Professor Have you lost my voice? No. Back again. <clears throat> uh, Professor Lovell said to me, well, what sort of job would you like? So I gave him the job description of this job that I knew which was coming up. So, so he said, oh, when can you start? I said, Monday. <laughs> That's why I can't give any advice to my children on applying for jobs. <laughs> So when you when you came, was that did you go straight into the space tracking work? Was that your first? Yes, that was that was that was what I was taken on to do, and right. that's what I did uh, well into the seventies. There, there was moon probes, Mars probes, Venus probes, things like this to look at from the Russians, and also. Um, as far as the moon was concerned, there was the Apollo series, which was so mind-boggling in what it was trying to do that you could just not 
take an interest in it at all. So, so when you were there, how did you know? I mean, for example, presumably the Ameri- it was very clear when the Americans were launching uh, a rocket because they were very open about it. But if the, if the Soviets were less open about it, how did you know when to swing the Lovell telescope round and, and, and point it at the moon? <laughs> it, it was very easy to lose friends at George Lund around that time because you, you heard that the Russians had launched a moon probe. So you knew that in about three days' time, it was going to get to the moon. And when it got to the moon, you would want to be using the Lovell telescope. But unfortunately, at the present time, there were some people called radio astronomers actually using it. And they wanted to carry on doing their research. So there were negotiations so that we could borrow the Lovell telescope um, for when it got to the moon. And this is what gave rise to building what was called the Finder telescope. This was only, <laughs> only 50 foot in diameter and was, bound, was built literally outside my lab. And the equipment for the Russian moon probes was continuously mounted on that. So when it was in, when we found out that a Russian moon probe had been launched, I could go into work and I could virtually switch that equipment on straight away and start looking for it. Um, because it was smaller, it had a, a wider beam in which it could pick up signals, so it was easier to find it. And because it was early on, it hadn't gone a long way away, so the signals were stronger, so you didn't need a big aerial. And so that gave us a, a couple of days uh, to find out where it was, what frequency it was transmitting on, and what time we would expect it to get to the moon. During that time, negoti- negotiations were then carried on with the radio astronomers in order to uh, borrow the Ch- little telescope. Chuck them off from. the telescope. Yeah. Well, not chuck them off, <laughs> no, borrow it from them. But it, this, in fact, when you come to Apollo 11, um, had a great knock-on effect because at that time we were tracking the Russian moon probe Luna 15. It had got there and gone into orbit around the moon. Um, and we were tracking that using the Lovell telescope. But we wanted to, to look at the Apollo space probe, the moon probe, uh, as well. And luckily we had this 50-foot radio telescope um, where the, the Russian equipment had just been taken off it and so we then put the equipment on to receive signals from the Apollo moon missions so that we, we were running virtually two telescopes side by side. This is a and picture of the, uh, <clears throat> that's the yeah. 50 foot telescope in the middle uh, that you can that's see. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that was the one that was used to, yeah, the both 50-foot telescope pointed at the moon and the Lovell yeah. telescope pointed yes, at the moon. Yes, that's right, yes. So your, <coughs> your lab, in the middle there, you can see the control building, um, and your lab was in the back of that <laughs> building there. Yes, this was quite an early photograph, and my lab was that wooden hut that you can see on the roof. <laughs> Well, it, I didn't know that, actually. It, it started off that my lab was actually inside the building to the left of it, up on no. the first floor. And when they built the 50-foot telescope, they needed somewhere for the control gear for it. And so that was put in that wooden hut. And then when my work expanded and I was doing more of this, they decided that they would expand my lab and... Uh, they, they built a lab around that wooden hut. Hmm. That's, um, I mean, before, you know, the, the, the Soviets were, were, were basically outperforming the Americans. Is that the, true in the early part of the space race? Well, it's really a, it is a question of how you talk about outperforming. Hmm. They have the capability of launching double-decker buses. This is Russian. 
um, into space. But um, things that weigh as much as a double decker bus, well, yes, rather than actual. Well, oh, oh yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> but we got a scoop there. <laughs> um, but certainly, their electronics on it, from the signals that we picked up, were very basic and very similar. And when we switched over to picking up signals from the Apollo missions, it was just like entering into an, another world, you know, it's like going from sort of slow war signals to brilliant colour TV or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the Americans were technologically far advanced from the Russians, but the Russians had the capability of launching heavy weights, so it didn't really matter quite as much mm. how sophisticated the equipment was. Mm. I mean, we've got this great story of, uh, of Luna 9 that you were involved with. I don't know, will you tell us a little bit about, about <laughs> Luna 9? Oh, yes, poor Professor Lavore. I, I really say that, it was most unfortunate. Luna 9 went to the moon. They had been trying on several uh, moon missions to soft land a space probe on the moon's surface. And they had failed with varying success. But with Luna 9, they managed it. We, we picked up the signals from it as it was going down to the moon's surface. And we could tell that it had landed softly on the moon's surface. And then there was nothing. So we thought, oh dear, have they made another boob clanger or whatever? And then suddenly, after a few moments, we started getting signals again. And at, at this point, it was realized that what it was doing now was sending back pictures. Now, um, probably right to say in the old days, um, there was um, a, a, f a form of transmitting pictures called facsimile. Is that the right word? <laughs> yes. Um, and you, you sort of gradually scanned the picture like that um, and sent it over the radio waves. And this the, the signals that Luna 9 was sending back were essentially those. And, uh, well, we didn't, we didn't have a machine for uh, printing those out, and so a request was put out, and one of our <coughs> daily newspapers responded by providing a, a equipment to do it. Now, if you had managed to soft land a spacecraft on the surface of the moon and it was alive and kicking and sending back pictures which no one else had ever seen in the world. Wouldn't you be hell bent on getting them published and saying, what a good boy I am? And that's exactly what Professor Lovell thought. He thought, as soon as the Russians get these signals, these pictures, they're going to publish them, splash them out all around the world. But I'm a good guy, and what I'll do is I won't try and steal their thunder. I will delay for 24 hours before I publish them. Now, that's, that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. Well, it would be reasonable, except the Russians didn't publish theirs. And so even after a 24-hour delay, Sir Bernard's signals from Jodrell were the first to be publicized, and he got a lot of stick for it, mm. which is not really very fair, I think. Mm. So here's the, here's the picture, this is the... Yes, I mean, this is a sort of famous sort of picture. Now, this, this picture shows you what it's, happens if we don't have all the information. The signals came out and we put them into a standard commercial facsimile machine to produce these pictures. And when the Russians saw them, they said, oh, stupid old Jodrell, you, you got it all wrong. And in fact, these sort of lumps that you can see, which 
sort of look like squashed circles, they should really be round circles. And so that picture should be stretched. I think it was about two and a half times wider than it is. Now, we didn't know what the aspect ratio of the picture was going to be. Mm. Uh, we had no idea, so we made a sort of slight clangor there, but we, we showed the pictures. Mm. So the very first pictures ever sent from the surface of the moon, yes. packed into by Jodrell Bank and printed on a fax machine. Yes, that's right, yes. <laughs> Although if you, if you read the Daily Express, the Daily Express plugged themselves into the moon. Uh, <laughs> A few labs worth of equipment and a 250-foot telescope in between were somehow not mentioned. <laughs> um, let's let's sort of fast forward to uh, July of 1969 then, and uh, um, perhaps you could tell us in a bit more detail about how what was happening at the time, 50 years ago. Right. Well, it was it was frenetic. It was chaos. It was quite an occasion. So the first thing was that the Russians had launched a moon probe and it had arrived at the moon and was in orbit around the moon. Now, bearing in mind that the object of Apollo 11 was to land men on the moon and that they would probably bring back samples of the moon rock uh, to be analyzed and this sort of thing. But with Apollo, although it was designed absolutely fantastically, there was one flaw in the project. And that was when the astronauts were sitting on the moon's surface, ready to lift off and go back up into orbit around the moon and join the command module. And they had a switch which was to start the motors to lift them off the moon's surface. If that switch or the motors failed, there was nothing anyone could do to rescue them. There was nothing that the command pilot orbiting the moon could do in time. There was no way that they could launch another Apollo mission to get to the moon to rescue them. If that motor didn't work the first time, it was kaput. And even the President of the United States had a speech prepared for that eventuality. But here we have got the Russians and they are obviously going to try and soft land a space probe on the moon's surface. And as it turned out from later ones, the idea was then that it would automatically take a sem sample of the moon's surface, load it back into the spacecraft, and then the spacecraft would come up from the moon's surface come back to Earth and be sort of collected, found, or whatever. Mm. Uh, and, and so they will be able to do that and say, well, we've landed on the moon, we've brought back a moon sample at no thought of any fatalities to a human being. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they didn't manage it that time. L we all know how Apollo landed on the moon and the astronauts walked on the surface. Literally just about two hours before they were due to lift off back off the moon, up into orbit and then back to Earth, Luna 15 tried to soft land on the moon and it failed and it crashed into the surface and that was the end of it. As I say, they did do it 
later on with other probes, mm. but mm. not that one. So what, what was the scene like in, in Jodhra Bank? Where, where were you? Who was the... What was going on <laughs> yeah. during this period when you were watching these or listening to these momentous yes. events? Well, w one sort of convenient sort of thing is that the uh, Americans their tracking stations are spaced out all the way around the world. And so as the Earth rotates and the Moon sets to one tracking station, it's already risen to the next one and they can follow it on like that. Russia, however, is very much a landlocked country. And at that time, to my knowledge anyway, they didn't have any other tracking stations other than their main one which was somewhere in the Crimea. And what this meant was that by the time the moon got round to being due south of us, by that time it was already set to the Russian tracking station in the Crimea. So the first half of the moon's day, we would be using the level telescope, picking up the signals from Luna 15 because we didn't know what it was going to do and when it was going to do it. That was our prime object. Using the big telescope. Yeah. That was using with the level telescope, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, and then when the, the moon got to, to about due south of us, it was invariably the time when we got no more signals. And so at that point, we then started listening to the signals coming off a 50-foot telescope. Um, although we had equipment to sort of listen to the telemetry and the voices, etc., on, on both of them at the same time, we could only measure the actual frequency of any of them, only one of them at a time. Um, so, you know, you know that um, if a car goes past you, it sort of goes, it goes from high to low. Well, for the technically minded, this is a thing called the Doppler effect. And so, if you listen to the signal coming from the spacecraft and say, how high is it or how low is it, you can tell how fast it's traveling. And we use that then to measure what the acceleration is, how quickly it's going into the moon's surface. You have got that yeah, slide. Sure, yeah. So this is, tell, tell us about this famous uh, picture. Yes, it's, uh, well, forget about all this bit on the left-hand side. That's just, <laughs> the way, well, that's just the way of the computer joining up something that's going off scale. But if we look at this last curve coming down, um, the frequency is coming down, and it's coming down. Oh, yes, here it's coming down, and it's moving towards it sitting on the moon's surface and producing a steady frequency. Now, the thing is that. I think even I was surprised how sensitive this measurement was. So this, so this, is, a, this is a signal from the Eagle landing. This, this is a signal from the Eagle landing. And so, you see this little bump here, like that. Well, if you remember, when the Eagle was landing, uh, Neil Armstrong realized that they were going towards an area which had uh, quite a few boulders on it and he didn't like the look of it and so he took manual control of the LEM landing and just moved it on a little bit further and that little change in speed that he imparted to do that maneuver is shown by that graph mm. and I thought wow you know I know you can tell a lot from these graphs but that was something pretty good. I was quite surprised. <laughs> More pleased than surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's sort of, uh, I mean, have you, looking at sort of this, from this distance, so from 50 years on, how do you feel that you were, you know, independently, if you like, looking at what was happening on the moon, these sort of momentous events, no one's ever going to 
forget the no. first time a human being walked on the, walked on the moon. What, how do you feel about that, looking back? It was a strange sort of feeling because um, my job was really the Russian moon probes and deep space probes. Um, but, you know, we had the techniques and the capabilities of following Apollo. And, you know, at a time like this, you just wouldn't want to miss out on, on doing it. Um, and so it was fantastic to feel that, although we weren't making any big difference to the Apollo mission at all, in some way we were joining in and sharing with the Americans uh, the joy and elation of them be, being able to do it as, as they did. Mm. I mean, people were here. There was, there was, there was other people um, here at Jodrell, weren't there, at the time? So it wasn't just you. There was four of you, was that right, in Lab 5 in the yes. tracking lab? Yes, essentially the, the four that I mentioned, Professor Lovell, Professor J.G. Davis, myself and my technician yeah and we we made up the team mm. that uh, did the tracking mm. but they weren't the only people here right there were a lot of other people oh no the, the visitor center was open and um i was going to say it stayed open all night i don't think so it closed sometime in the early hours but um just let me just let me check on my crib sheet. <laughs> yes, Apollo landed at about quarter past eight in the evening. Well, quarter past nine, because we had to add summer time. And the moon set to Jodrell at about ten past eleven at night. But the astronauts coming out weren't until about four o'clock in the morning. So. Did I go home and have some sleep? Oh no, I stayed here. I stayed and watched the television receivers showing all the pictures from the EVAs. And the EVA finished at about six o'clock in the morning. Unfortunately, the moon was due to rise about one o'clock at midday the next day. So I had to go home, grab some sleep, come back, and start all over again the next day when the moon rose. But it, it, was, it was worth it. It was a fantastic experience, which, you know, never, never be repeated. Absolutely right. And I think, uh, can we all uh, thank Bob for sharing his memories of this, uh, of this fantastic experience with us? I think we've got time for uh, some questions, actually, if anybody would like to ask uh, Bob some questions about uh, any of the space tracking work that Jodrell Bank's been involved with, I think. <clears throat> Hello. <laughs> you said there was Russian equipment on the Lovell telescope to, to measure the lunar landers and that there was America you had to have American equipment on the 50 foot telescope to measure the Apollo ones so what was that was it decoding or what, what, was, what was the equipment that you needed to have I don't think there was any Russian equipment on the, on the Lovell telescope they were oh. using the Lovell telescope to look at the Russian spacecraft oh, using the 50 foot to look at Apollo 11 you're asking about the details of what equipment there was actually. oh right yeah no, it was equipment that I had uh, built, bought, designed, or whatever. This was my job from the early days, was so getting equipment. The equipment. It wasn't something that anyone had given to you from Russia or from... Oh, no, no. <laughs> it, no, we, we had built specific equipment okay. to pick up the Russian signals and specific equipment to pick up the American signals. But it was our equipment, yes. Had the, had the Russians asked you to track it, or you were you doing that? 
for public? Why, why were you doing it? There, there had been occasions when the Russians had actually asked us if we could record the signals for them, or on another occasion, um, after the event, they asked, could we send them any recordings we'd made? So as far as the Russian um, moon probes and deep space probes concerned, it was our standard, our norm, that we took recordings of all the telemetry in case they suddenly came to us and said, could you let us have a copy of it? But we never did that with the Americans. Um, I mean, they had their own network and things. I remember Bernard Lovell telling me that immediately after the signals from Luna 15, the one that crashed into the moon while the Apollo 11 astronauts were on the moon, as soon as those signals stopped, he said that a few minutes later the phone rang. Do you, do you, remember, do you remember that? I, I don't remember, no. no. Apparently it was the president of the USSR Academy of Sciences asking for a copy of the recordings. So, right, yeah. yeah. And so it was, it was nice to be in a position where we could supply those recordings. And, you know, that's why we did the recordings all, all the time. Mm -hmm. right. uh, to your knowledge, do you know if Jodwell has tracked any other... Sorry, I can't, can't hear you. Sorry, do you... <laughs> do you know if Jodwell has tracked any other of the Apollo crafts or any other space missions since 69. So Did we track any of the other Apollo spacecraft after 1969? Oh, sorry. Um, yes, I, I, I tracked all of them up to Apollo 17. Um, and then, of course, that was, that was the last one. There was one of them, actually, one of the Apollos, which was quite startling. It was one that had the lunar rover with it, and when the astronauts took off back from the moon to go up to the command module, the television camera on the lunar rover was focused on the spacecraft ready to ascend, and you heard the countdown of it, and when they said naught, there was sort of a puff, and suddenly there the spacecraft wasn't. It had shot up into the air, going back to the, the spacecraft. But yes, we, we, I tracked them all up until 17. Uh, I, I didn't track 13 at all. Um, that was the one that mm. had the disaster. Mm. You told me a good story about the hammer and the feather, actually, I, I remember. Oh, yes, on, on one of them, Apollo I think 15. we thought it was Apollo 15, was mm, it? I think so. Um, the astronauts did a famous experiment. If you get a hammer and a feather and just drop them like that, we all know the hammer's going to hit the ground first, it's the heavier, and the, the feather will all sort of gradually waft its way down. On the moon's surface, there's no atmosphere. And so theoretically, if you drop a hammer and a feather, they will both hit the ground at the same time. And on Apollo 15, they did that experiment. And we were receiving pictures from that Apollo spacecraft. And so in my lab, we saw them do this experiment and we saw the hammer and the feather land on the ground at the same time later. And five seconds later, we looked up, and there on the television set, the, you know, the terrestrial television set, they were doing the same thing, just dropping it. And what the Americans must have done was somewhere between them receiving the signals and transmitting them out to the broadcast authorities. There was a man there with a pair of scissors waiting to cut the tape just in case something disastrously happened to the spacecraft or the, the spacemen. You know, a, a 
a puncture, a tear in their suit, and pfft, that's the end of them. And so they, they put this five second delay in. So I had two views of the hammer and the feather dropping to the ground at the same time. Any other questions? Hello, Bob. You mentioned earlier that the Americans were very willing and free with the information about their missions, whereas the Soviets were less so. I was wondering if that situation continued and what it's like currently. Are the Americans still as open with their space missions, or do you, does Jodrell end up tracking things that the Americans would rather not people knew? Sorry, I'm not feeling quite concerned. Um, did that say, uh, if the Americans were <coughs> open about things in the past and the Soviet yes. Union wasn't, has that situation continued? Um, I, it was, well, maybe you should I, say I, about what space tracking we've done since. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really know is the answer because my space tracking only went up into some time in the 70s. Um, and I mean, I, I quite honestly thought that when the Americans had finished on the moon with Apollo 17, that the Russians would have said, right, the moon's open to us now, no competition, we'll go in and do what we want to do. And they never did. And, you know, it was, um, it was quite a surprise. Um, and so I think both America and Russia concentrated more on their deep space probes to go into Mars and Venus. And I'm, I must say that, in general, the Russian ones didn't have much success. Um, but up until when I finished uh, doing the space tracking, yes, it, it remained the same of openness of the Americans. Mm. I mean, it's fair to say, I mean, Jodrell didn't, hasn't continued to be involved in space tracking. Oh, course. no, no, yeah. no. I mean, I always have to keep re reminding people that it was only a very small part of John Rawls' work. Um, Professor Lovell famously at one time told the press that, look, this tracking of space probes only accounts for about 1% of John Rawls' effort, which was rather amusing because at that time there were about 100 members of staff at John Rawls, and I was the only person whose full-time job was tracking space probes. And so I proverbially got nicknamed Mr. One Percent. <laughs> I think that's probably a good point to finish on. <laughs> Mr. One Percent, but a major and significant contribution to the history of exploration of space. Thank you very much for your time, Bob. Thank you.